Well, I see we've got a, a, a good number of folks that have joined us tonight. I thank, thank you all for being here uh, to join us for our conservation lecture series. The virtual format that we have here certainly lets people connect remotely and makes it a little bit easier to to navigate the logistics of coming to a lecture. So we appreciate that technology. Just a reminder, as far as a few housekeeping notes, we um, we ask you to mute your microphones and also not have your video on, please. And also do not use the chat feature if you have questions. We do encourage you to use the Q&A and produce questions as the talk progresses. And at the end of the talk, I will cover all the questions. Hopefully we'll have the time for those. And this recording or this presentation is being recorded. So uh, additional views can be done or you can let your friends know about it. Uh, and this, month being October, we try to do Halloween related wildlife, uh, in this case, obviously bats, but it also ties in nicely to our, our Boo in the Zoo Halloween event. So we enjoy the theme and appreciate the speakers making themselves available to us. Our speaker Today, we'll talk about native bats and also other species of bats, including their natural history and what challenges they have to their population and what negatively impacts them. She'll help debunk some myths about bats and also give you plenty of interesting facts about the bats themselves and what is being done with field work, especially in South Carolina with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Our speaker grew up in Oregon and attended Oregon State University and initially started in avian ecology for 10 years and then switched to another wing species, bats. And uh, since 2012 has been working with bats as the state biologist for bats and also she achieved the status of the TWS certified bat biologist. So she has quite the credentialed bat experience. Um, with her role at SCDNR, she studies bats through mist netting and um, evaluates bat boxes and monitoring of, of vocalizations of bats. And part, part of the acoustic program that is the, and we'll get this, Right, the South Carolina North American Bat Monitoring Acoustic Program and the Citizen Science Bat Watch that allows the public to be involved with bat biology and conservation, as well as produces great data for Jen and other bat biologists to use. Uh, all that information factors into bat conservation and the management of the species, especially those that are imperiled bat species uh, in this region. Uh, in addition to all those professional activities that she's involved with, she uh, really enjoys time with her family. She has a, a dedicated husband that helps with the two amazing children, two boys that she has, and juggling all that keeps Jen quite busy. And so we appreciate Jen Kindle joining us as our speaker today for, for BATS. Take it away, Jen. Awesome. Well, thank you again for letting me speak about bats today. Um, yeah, I'm the, the bat biologist for South Carolina DNR. Uh, we work statewide and um, have a lot of a lot of what we do is funded by grants and seasonal technicians. Uh, so we do the best we can, but there are a lot of bats and a lot of species and a lot of habitats and bats are very challenging to survey, but um, we have a great time doing doing our best. So I'm going to jump right in here and um, hopefully not overload you with too much bad information. Um, I will start by actually going back here for a second and just telling you this is our Raffinesque big eared bat that you had seen flying back and forth, flying this whole time. This, um, Yeah, and I don't know if you can see that it's a little shiny thing attached to the back of it. That's the uh, radio transmitter we put on that Raffinesque big eared bat to follow her to her maternity site. 
So jumping in, yeah. So this is one of the big things about bats, of course, is that they are feared. Um, and I'll talk a lot about that in this talk. Uh, but uh, they are small creatures and um, can come in many different colors. This is a hoary bat um, that's got, you know, various colors on it uh, that is that I consider pretty beautiful. A lot of these pictures are from MerlinTuttle.org, by the way. So I hope to impart some of these items um, to you today about, about bats and why they're fascinating, beneficial, how fear hurts them, what white nose syndrome is, and the things you can do to help. So yeah, I just like to share that video because it shows all the different kinds of bats across the world. Um, Bat Conservation International is one of many conservation organizations for bats, um, but they had a pretty good video, so I thought I would show that one. So worldwide, there are more than 1,400 species of bats, uh, and um, they are the only flying, true flying mammal. Uh, of course, we've got flying squirrels that are gliders, um, but not very different from bats. One of the really fascinating things about bats is that they have an extremely long lifespan. So there's actually um, been records of bats found to live more than 30 years in the wild. And for a creature of this size, um, that is impressive. So that is um, many, many times longer than uh, like a small a mouse their size would live because um, they can usually live depending on the species, like the mice can live like five to seven years. So there's something very special going on um, with their, um, uh, their, the science behind why they have such long lives. They're in the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing. Um, and as you can see in this picture, you can see all the different fingers that make up the wing for a bat. The, the ears, of course, are, are in this species very large. This is a Townsend's big-eared bat, which we don't have here, but we have very similar, looks almost exactly the same, raffinous big-eared bat that I showed you in the beginning uh, that have those just gigantic ears. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the different uh, ranges of bat sizes. So we've got worldwide the smallest bat is the kitty's hognose bat, also known as the bumblebee bat. Uh, this picture is great to show size, but it's not great in terms of safety. Always, always uh, wear gloves, thick gloves, if you're, if you're going to be handling bats, because obviously we're going to talk about rabies here in a little bit. Um, but uh, this person probably has rabies pre-exposure vaccine already, which most people do not. The largest bat in the world is a giant golden crown flying fox, which is so cool that bats can get this big. They, um, as you can see in the picture, are basically the size of a fox, and um, that's why they're called flying foxes. Uh, these guys have uh, larger eyes, smaller ears than our insectivorous bats here in South Carolina. They are uh, fruit bats, so they uh, need those eyes to look for, for fruit, obviously, and they're using less, um, they use a tiny bit of echolocation, but not really like our bats do, because uh, they're not nocturnal um, like our bats are. So here's another example of um, a bat outside of South Carolina um, that is a lesser long-nosed bat. Um, pollinating. So, of course, bats worldwide do a lot for us in terms of um, pollination. They pollinate the agave plant, which, of course, without, we would not have tequila. So every time you're drinking some uh, tequila, you can thank a bat, or if, even if you're eating wild bananas. Uh, they do spread the seeds of things like chocolate, black pepper, and figs, and they protect uh, our many of our crops, a lot of our staple crops uh, in terms of rice and cotton and corn. I'm sorry, my dog is 
breaking up here, but um, coffee obviously is really important to a lot of people. So uh, they protect these crops by eating insects that would otherwise destroy those crops. So zooming into South Carolina, we've got 14 different bat species. Nine of these species roost in colonies. Generally, seven of those are in caves and tree hollows, and two other species tend to like to use structures, um, especially these days with, I mean, obviously not originally, um, but these days there are some species that really like to use attics and old, old barns and buildings and things like that. The other five species are tree species and uh, they are more solitary roosters. So they will roost in uh, the leaves and um, also um, palm fronds of uh, palmetto, pal palmetto uh, trees on, on the coast. And uh, they will also roost in Spanish moss, as you can see there. So these species are also a lot more colorful. going to walk through the 14 different species with you, starting with the Myotis genus of bats. So in South Carolina, we've got four of those, and uh, they tend to be smaller, uh, brown little guys. <laughs> um, and so the northern long-eared bat's that top one there, and it is it is the bat that is having the hardest time with white-nose syndrome right now. Um, I'll be talking about that um, later. But um, got little brown bats, eastern small-footed bats, and southeastern bats as well. Uh, moving on, we have these other species that tend to uh, roost in houses, actually. The Brazilian free-tailed bat, evening bat, and big brown bat um, are the species most commonly found in attics or um, under shutters or uh, um, in, in bat boxes. They love bat boxes. And uh, so we've got the, also the Refinus big-eared bat um, is a colonial rooster as well. It's so a state endangered bat and the tricolored bat, um, which is a smaller species that also gets hit by white nose syndrome. The Brazilian free-tailed bat, which I might say this multiple times, it's always my, one of my favorite bat facts, but um, it is the fastest flying animal on the planet. And uh, because it goes flying, flapping flight, straight line speed at about 100 miles an hour um, versus, you know, peregrine will dive 200 miles an hour, but that's not flapping flight. So, so far, bats have the record for fi fastest flying animal on the planet. Um, there might be a bird out there that is ready to, uh, the scientist is ready to break that fact record. Not yet. The rest of these species are tree species. Like I said, they are more colorful, yellow bats, red bats, hoary bats, silver haired bats. Um, and these guys tend to have longer wings and fly longer distances. And they don't, they're not as well adapted to sort of cluttered um, shrubby environments. Um, and that's why uh, they're, they're faster, longer distance flyers. They tend to fly above a lot of that. So we have bats are in trouble a lot um, from white nose syndrome. And so as we've been watching the disease spread across the country, a lot of these species have been declining. So Northern Long-Eared Bat is our federally endangered bat here in South Carolina. It had been uh, federally threatened for some time. Uh, and then they, the, it's a long story, but Fish and Wildlife Service got sued because a lot of the species, a lot of the populations were just blinking out. And so um, there are now, because mortality from white nose syndrome is, is 99% in this species. Um, so that's why they're endangered. Tricolored bat was proposed federally endangered. Uh, so we're waiting to hear back whether or not they're gonna be listed um, as threatened or endangered. The final rule was supposed to come out last month and they delayed it. So we're not really sure how long it's gonna take. Little brown bat is also proposed to be listed. So we're not really sure if it's gonna be listed as endangered or threatened, um, but that listing was also supposed to come out last month and um, they delayed that as well. So we'll wait to hear back on that. I mentioned a rough nest big eared bat is our state endangered bat and uh, one of the reasons for that, it is not affected by white nose syndrome, but 
it uh, relies on bottom land hardwood forests, which of course are in trouble compared to you know what we had historically. They really rely on um, water tupelo species like water tupelo that um, are huge have huge cavities, kind of have huge cavities, and so the you know the larger bigger trees, <laughs> the larger trees have have been taken down. Eastern small-footed bat is our state threatened bat. These guys get hit by white nose syndrome a little bit, but don't seem to be hit as hard. So that's good news. Uh, fascinating mammals. There's so much to talk about with bats. Um, and so I had to pick some of the, the bigger things um, to talk about, but of course echolocation is one of the big things they do and uh, to find insects. So here's a quick video of bats flying and capturing insects on the wing. You might be able to hear their calls too. So they're capturing these insects with their tail membrane, also known as the uropatagium, and popping insects in their mouth or sometimes with their wing wing, their actual wings. Um, so when you're seeing them flying uh, in real time, it looks like they're, they can't fly very well. They're really fluttery, but what's actually happening is that they're doing somersaults in the air while they're eating and then moving on to the next insect is really impressive. Um, and they don't always, <laughs> that last piece showed it, <laughs> that moth got away, but <laughs> um, it's tricky to catch those guys. All right, so obviously they send out those uh, calls to um, to capture insects, but also to drink water. Sometimes some of the species that are adapted to cluttered environments can in pick insects off of leaves, which is really impressive. Bats also migrate. The only one that is a true migrator in our state is the silver-haired bat. Um, the other other bats that tend to migrate, as I mentioned, are the tree bats um, outside of our state. So they're, the rest of them are considered resident. Um, whether or not the individuals leave and move around um, is unknown. It's very possible. But we have found all the other species um, in, in the state in the winter. Bats can hibernate for varying lengths of time. So we've got um, the the eastern small-footed bat that hibernates for the shortest amount of time, and it might be why it's not hit by white nose syndrome as much. And then the longest is the tricolored bat, so it'll stay in for a long time. And so you're seeing there in that image, uh, bats hibernating. Those are tricolored bats with um, glistening fur. And I, in all my talks, I always talk about how uh, how neat that is to to walk into a hibernaculum. And uh, a lot of times these are old mines that people from, you know, 100 years ago were finding gold in or other things. <laughs> um, and so I'm walking in there looking for for like these bat gems that are glistening on the walls and they're just beautiful little guys. You may have heard insects um, are, you know, taken care of by a lot of bats. So we call that a pest supp suppression service. Um, and so little brown bats, for example, can eat 150 mosquitoes in 10 minutes. A colony of big eared, I'm sorry, southeastern bats can eat uh, 50 tons of insects per year. Uh, and a big brown bats, 150 of them can eat 1.5 million pests per year. That same little brown bat can eat nine species of mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus. Our fastest flyer can, a female that's lactating, can eat two thirds of her body weight at night. And the big brown bat can, 150 of those can prevent 33 million larvae from hatching. So they really benefit us, whether or not we realize it while we're sleeping. Uh, but if we want to know what kind of numbers we're talking about, someone did a study in 2011 uh, that looked at how much they saved the ag industry in terms of pest suppression service. And in South Carolina alone, every year they save our ag industry $115 million. And that's an average. Um, so it's about 23 billion across the US every year. Uh, and then, you know, I was talk about pesticides uh, because um, when you use pesticides, 
you know, even if it's in your yard to try to kill in, kill mosquitoes, um, bats can bioaccumulate those pesticides and um, die. So really, uh, you end up killing the natural predator of the insects you're trying to get rid of. So um, without bats, of course, people would be using a lot more pesticides, um, and which is can be harmful on the environment. Right, the spelling myths. This is always a fun one. Um, so some of those myths out there are talking about bats being flying mice, uh, but obviously they're not. Um, they're more re closely related, uh, for example, to us than they are to birds um, or um, to mice. Uh, you can see kind of the bones there that show that um, how much closer it is. And also, obviously we've been talking about uh, fingers as well. Um, Bats are not blind. They have eyeballs and they use them. Uh, so as you know, as it gets darker and darker, they use them less. Um, but for especially for insectivorous bats here in South Carolina. And then, of course, people think of them as pests. And uh, I'm not going to call, you know, insects pests. Insects themselves are very fascinating and awesome. But obviously, if you have too many and there's a big problem, um, they can be considered pests. And um, bats can, you know, are eating those uh, so there, uh, yeah, I'll talk more about that in a second. Another one is vampire bats. So since we're getting close to Halloween, we want to talk about vampire bats. Look at that cute face. Who's going to be scared of a vampire bat like that? Um, <laughs> so they do have sharp teeth, but they do not suck blood. They can make these small cuts and, and then they drink up the, the blood from there. And usually that's, that's feeding on cattle and chickens. Um, it's, there are only three vamp vampire bat species in the world, uh, you know, out of that 1,400 species altogether. So there really aren't many at all. And then, of course, none of those are in the U.S. Actually, I should mention um, that there is a uh, anticoagulant that's, that scientists are have researched, and they've called it um, Draculin. That is coming from the saliva of bats, which I think is really awesome. So the myth here is that bats are the biggest carrier of rabies. Um, and that is not true. Less than 1% of natural bat populations carry rabies, according to a study done in Canada. There's only been one study so far, um, but it's really showing um, that, yeah, these species are not riddled, riddled with rabies. Unfortunately, a lot of um, uh, myths out there and rumors are that bats are dirty, disease-ridden things, but they're not. Um, however, people do contract rabies from bats more than other mammals. So the difference there is um, that they're not. There's less one percent. Then why is this true? And my my hypothesis is that people are not aware of the risks and they're more likely to encounter bats. You're not going to go pick up a rabid raccoon outside. At least you shouldn't be. <laughs> and then when it comes to bats, uh, people are more likely to pick them up when they see them on the ground. You know, they're just, if a bat is on the ground, that means it's not doing well. Um, so you should never touch a bat, never pick up a bat. Tell kids um, that too, because kids can be very curious. Um, so they're, uh, yeah, people are generally not more aware of the risk. And sometimes bats can get in buildings, unfortunately. Um, so they're more likely to, um, for people are more likely to encounter them that way. So I did want to talk about rabies really quickly because it is a scary disease. And as I mentioned, I just want to make sure everybody's safe. If you do find a bat in your home or outside, obviously don't touch it. But um, if you find a bat in your home, make sure you isolate the bat. That's the first thing that you need to think about. You don't want to let it go yet because you need to know whether or not, or not it needs to be tested for rabies. Um, even though less than 1% have it, we still want to be careful. So uh, isolating a bat is can be tricky because you can be, you know, scared and not, not knowing what to do. Um, but if it's if you can get it in a room and close the door behind, you know, with no one else or pets in it, um, then you can go from there. Call your Department of Health and Environmental Control and talk to them. Their uh, recommendation or their three things they talk about when it comes to bats in buildings is uh, um, potential uh, exposure. So if you wake up to find a bat in your room, that's a potential exposure. 
the reason they tell me that's a thing is because um, apparently some people can be bitten by a bat and not know it while they're sleeping. As a researcher, I can always tell when I'm bit by a bat. <laughs> I wear gloves. I have rabies pre-exposure vaccine. Um, I wear like like thick gloves and um, I can still feel them, but I, apparently some people can't when they're sleeping. Another potential exposure, if there's a bat where children, pets, or people with impaired mental capacity are left unattended and couldn't tell you. Or of course, if someone, a pet or a person was in direct contact with the bat. Just reach out to DHEC and talk to them about it. And if um, it needs to be tested for rabies, they can do that. And then if it comes back negative, then you don't have to worry about anything. If it comes back positive, then you can get the post-exposure vaccine. Um, so it's very important to be able to do that. All right, back to bats. So the next myth is uh, the idea that you can catch COVID from bat. Obviously, this was a big deal the past few years. Um, but no, you cannot catch COVID from a bat. Um, there were there were um, rumors about it, but uh, the risk of COVID is from humans, not wildlife. The origins of um, of the virus are still unclear, um, and bats may have been involved in some way or another. But um, you know, a while ago, it had been like a thought of from bats to a pangolin to humans, maybe. But um, that's pretty old at this point. Um, so. The facts are that bats and other wildlife are natural hosts to other other kinds of coronaviruses that don't affect us. Uh, bats also do have a unique immunity um, that helps them tolerate viruses, and that in its own right is super fascinating. And researchers are looking into into all that. Um, and they may bats may hold the key to breakthrough vaccines because of this really fascinating way um, that their bodies deal with viruses. So I'd like to show this video because they are very tiny creatures. Uh, rabies is scary, but the more you know, the better you are um, at understanding what's actually going on and that bats themselves are not scary. They just need your help, as this video shows. Speaking of needing help, white nose syndrome is a disease that's been hitting these, hitting these creatures for some time now. Um, it's a disease that affects, infects, it's actually a fungus that infects their skin while they're trying to hibernate. And it wakes them up and has and makes them burn their energy reserves uh, and and causes them to starve to death. So this has been a major problem since 2006 when it first came over to the United States. Um, and six about six million bats have been killed by white nose syndrome, unfortunately. What does that mean? We don't really know exactly how many bats we have because they're so difficult to survey, but we know that. From looking at the counts in hibernacula in the winter, that there's been a tenfold decrease in North America. And of course, because of that, significant local extinctions have resulted. Um, surveys and studies have looked at um, potential extinction of the little brown bat by 2026. Uh, the eastern small footed bat had a 78% decline. And then the northern long eared bat lost 70% of its uh, forber hibernac. So these are the kinds of impacts that white nose has made on these species. This is showing a uh, map of the disease spreading across the U.S. There are 12 species known to get white nose syndrome. So one of the positive things is that not every bat can, gets this disease, which is good. The species here in South Carolina that get it are big browns, eastern small-footed, little browns, northern long-eared, and tricolored. And the ones that are starred there are federally threatened or endangered. The fungus... Uh, the spores of this fungus that causes white nose syndrome can be found on seven other species. And for us, that's Eastern red, Brazilian free tail, raffinesques, and silver haired bat. People have been looking at studies on what white nose syndrome means to our ag industry. So, a study done in um, Canada showed that losing these bat populations has, has, has resulted in a loss of between 426 to $495 million per year to um, ag in the Eastern US. 
So it really does affect us in the end. All right, with that, we're gonna take a breather. That's, that's some of the negative things that have been happening with bats. Um, but of course there are things we can do about it um, and uh, lots of different cool research that's going on to try to help bats. And this is our Brazilian free tail again. <laughs> so what can you do? Respecting, respecting entry restrictions for uh, mines and caves in the winter is a big one. And if you are allowed to go into certain mines and caves, make sure you use uh, decontamination protocols. There are some um, online, uh, on, there's a whitenosesyndrome.org website that you can go to and look up how to clean your gear um, after you're, you go into uh, a site. And that can mean uh, some of these larger show caves in other states, especially. We have seen the disease spread from those show caves to other places um, because they try their best to have people who are going in to clean their shoes and everything, but it doesn't always work, um, unfortunately. And there are issues, of course, with decontamination um, to the for the general public. When we go into hibernacula, we wear Tyvek and actually co and um, masks so we don't spread COVID to our bats in case that's a possibility and gloves and we're, we're just like covered top to bottom and then we throw all that away. Um, so we're more protective in that way, but um, just things to keep in mind when you're visiting show caves, try to make sure you clean your gear, um, which is the National White Nose Syndrome Decon Protocol. And then of course, don't handle bats. It's not only for your safety, but for bats. The, the One of the worst things that can happen is have someone get rabies from a bat. I mean, that's a terrible, horrible thing for anybody. Um, and then um, bats get a really bad rap. Bat boxes. These are uh, great things you can do to put, to provide bat habitat. The box on the left is a rocket box and the box on the right is our two multi-chamber boxes back to back. And these are the, the ways I, the box types and the ways I usually recommend. Um, the rocket box is the best of the best. It is um, a chamber and a chamber and a chamber. And the bats are coming in and out of the bottom and in both of these. Um, but the rocket box just has more options. If the bats get too hot on one side, they can go out to uh, another side and that kind of thing. Um, multi-chamber boxes are also good, but especially if you put them back to back or if you can put them on a building, if you don't mind, you know, guano, the bat poop is gonna be coming out the bottom. So make sure, you know, and sometimes the urines, if it's on a building. So if it's like an old barn, you don't care about, great. Um, but if you're worried about it on your house, you may just keep that in mind. Um, different shades of paint uh, are important. I can share more resources about that um, with you later. A Bat Conservation International website has a lot of great stuff on there as well as Merlin Tuttle's website uh, for how long to put it up and everything else. And generally I'd say on the coast in South Carolina, it's bat boxes need to be, have about four hours of sun and in the upstate more like six hours of sun. So they stay nice and toasty. Bat boxes are generally for maternity colonies. So they net like it nice and warm. I mentioned Bat Conservation International has research tested designs. There are so many bat boxes out there you can buy that are not gonna be good for the bats. If they do end up using it, they might you might end up creating an ecological trap and killing them. So make sure you get the right kind. They need vents and other things. Talking about bat boxes, I wanted to discuss this uh, rocket box uh, that we put up at Santee Coastal Reserve. Uh, we had found northern long ear bats down there on the coast um, in 20. Oof, I don't know what year it was. 2016 is when we found when Palmetto Bluff Conservancy found them on the coast for the very first time, which was exciting because we thought they were just mountain bats. But then there, we found this coastal population, obviously using very different habitat. Anyway, we've been studying them at Santee Coastal and wanted to put up a box. So we found funding through Greenville Zoo and their grants, um, which was fantastic to, um, to use to get a, a rocket box up at Santee Coastal for the, the federally endangered Northern long eared bat. And so I'm gonna show you a, a three minute clip, I believe of that, that um, South Carolina, uh, the What's Wild 
folks, uh, I think it's SCETV put together. It's a piece of it. And let's see. I'm going to let it buffer just for a second here. Okay. And it might be a little laggy, but I think it, I've heard it's still okay. So we'll try that. But organizations like SCDNR and the U.S. Forest Service aren't the only ones lending a helping hand. Meet John Gillespie, a passionate bat enthusiast, also known as the Batman of Traveler's Rest. When he's not actively volunteering with bat counts across the state, John can be found in his workshop, dedicating his time and skills to crafting bat boxes. To him, it's all about doing what he can to save the bats. With meticulous care, he handcrafts durable rocket boxes that provide comfortable and safe roosting spaces. John's bat boxes are designed with a keen understanding of bats' needs. They are insulated and feature multiple chambers, allowing bats to move within the box to find their desired temperature. This thoughtful design ensures that the bats have optimal conditions for roosting and reproduction. Funding for the materials is provided by donations, people who want a box of their own, or from John's own pocket. Some boxes are even made for the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources, who utilize them in their heritage preserves and parks across the state. These carefully crafted boxes contribute to the conservation efforts of SCDNR, providing additional roosting options for bats while simultaneously fueling their ongoing research. This box here was specifically made to attract northern long-eared bats, one that's facing extinction because of white-nose syndrome. The hope is some will travel further south and make John's box their home. It's through dedicated work like this that these remarkable creatures stand a fighting chance to survive and stay wild. Right. So I will mention one more thing about that bat box. We put temperature lockers in it as well to make sure that the box doesn't get overheated. And we found over this past season, we just put up the spring that the box is not getting overheated. It might be a little bit cool, in fact, um, but there aren't there is not a colony of bats using it yet. So once there's a colony in there, the temperature is going to get toasty once they're all packed in. Um, so that's a good sign. So I think we're going to just paint it a darker color and see how it goes. Near the end of the season, we did have one bat up at the very top corner using it. I couldn't tell if it was a northern longbeard, um, but that's a really good sign that one uh, a bat was starting to use it already. So hopefully this coming season, uh, we'll see some northern longbeard bats using that box. Right. More things you can do. We have a citizen science project called South Carolina Bat Watch. And what it is, is counting bats emerging from boxes or a roost that you know of, uh, an old barn, whatever you, wherever you see bats emerging, uh, you can count them pre and post the pup, pre and post pup season. So you would count them. Um, I think there is a different dates and I don't remember them off the top of my head, but there's this website you can go to <laughs> and I'll tell you uh, spring, early spring you'll count the bats in there, which are gonna be the adults. And then once the pups are flying, which is later like in July, um, it'll be pups and adults that you'll be counting. So you can submit that data in the data sheet we have there, or we do have an app for that in Survey123, which is um, a free app you can use because uh, our form is available to the public. Here's what it looks like when we're doing a bat watch at In Traveler's Rest, looking at the bat boxes at Sunrift Adventures. Uh, they have eight bat boxes there. John Gillespie, though, you just heard about who makes bat boxes, is the manager of all these bats. They call him the Batman of Traveler's Rest, and it's really awesome. We, in fact, we have a bat celebration at the end of the Friday, at uh, the end of October, the last Friday of October every year. So please come and join us. Uh, we're even gonna have Paws Animal 
folks bringing, I think, owls, which is kind of a funny thing to bring because owls eat bats, but (laughs) they're bringing them earlier and obviously they're um, under control. They're not going to be flying around. Um, And then they're going to take them away. And then hopefully the bats will emerge at sunset. They tend to emerge whenever they want. So sometimes they'll emerge while I'm giving a talk and other times they won't emerge at all if it's too cold. Usually they do, though, even when it's about 50. Um, But if it gets any cooler than 50, they'll probably stay in the box. And in any case, we have uh, prizes for, for kids and have a bat talk. It's a lot of fun. Volunteering for us or for anybody else who does bat research is a great way you can help. Uh, We are always trying to learn more about bats in our state, and it is difficult, as I mentioned. One of the really interesting things we have been learning is about bats using road culverts as like, like, um, like a cave that they would normally use in the wintertime in other states. South Carolina, as you may know, does not have a lot of caves. So we're, we count bats in rock shelters, mostly old mines, which I, you know, don't love to go into, especially the older they get. So we're been moving over to road culverts, uh, especially because we can find bats across the entire state. A lot of hibernating bats in the past have just been up in the, the mountainous region uh, where we have mines and rock shelters, but we didn't know where they were the rest of the state for hibernation time. So anyway, you're more than welcome to come join us if you want to crawl around in some culverts. Obviously, we're not crawling. There are the bigger culverts. Um, So you really just park and walk down there. It's really the kind of the easiest bat survey we have outside of bat watch. Uh, But yeah, you can join us and count count bats uh, just hanging on the walls and they're hibernating. Sometimes they squeeze in the crevices like this silver-haired bat. And we're also taking information for the Southeastern Aquatic Resources Partnership. Uh, You can see the water that's flowing through this culvert is a barrier to fish and aquatic organisms going back and forth. So we're helping each other out. They're telling us if they find bats, we tell them, we take pictures and fill out their form for whether or not the culvert is a barrier to aquatic life. Some more pictures of bats hibernating in the culverts. We actually were really excited. A couple of years ago, found the large, uh, second largest uh, tricolored bat hibernacula in the state is in a culvert um, under I-26. So we try hard to find these bats, but a lot of times we're apparently driving over them all the time and don't know it, especially in winter. So. This culvert needed repair, and as you may know, I-26 is being worked on. So DOT, we've worked with DOT, and um, they're taking, they're doing what they need to do to to not to basically exclude the bats if they need to. Uh, when it's time to work on this culvert, um, they're going to make sure there are no bats in there when they're working on it. Um, there are lots of other culverts also that maybe nearby that they, they these bats could use. So here's our map of where we found bats across the state in the wintertime. Lots of tricolored bats, which again is one of those species we're not sure um, the federal government is going to list as endangered or threatened. But now we know where a lot of them are, which is great. Raffinus figured bats also hibernating these things, southeastern silver-haired evening and big brown bats. You can see that's a really hot spot there south of Columbia on I-26 not terribly far from Congaree National Park. So there's habitat nearby that they're probably utilizing as well. All right, spring and summer, we have volunteer opportunities to record bat calls and net and track bats. Uh, our NA bat program, it's a North American program. We have one in South Carolina. At, we were actually one of the first states to really um, get this pro- project running, thanks to Dr. Susan Loeb out of Clemson University. And we're recording bat calls in these cells across the state. If you wanna learn more about that, get a hold of me or look at scbatmonitoring.weebly.com. You can either, uh, usually the help we need most is running, driving the routes that we have scheduled. You'll drive and record bat calls and you'll do that twice in the same week every year. So you just do two surveys a year. Netting and tracking is um, quite the experience. We're netting bats five hours after sunset. So if you're up for that, we're happy to have you record data and you can take, you can see bats. Obviously you can't handle them unless you have 
vaccines and um, titers checked and everything, but it is really great to have people out there helping us transmit our bats and take data on them. All right. One of the biggest, easiest things you can do for bats is educate others about everything that you've learned today and everything that you will learn after this. I'm sure you'll look up some stuff about bats. Um, one of the biggest things that, that fall right now is the perfect time to exclude bats from a building. So if you're worried about bats in your building or in any, any place you don't want them, um, now is the time to exclude them. Like what exclusion is, is finding all the spaces they're entering and exiting, sealing up all of them except for one or two major sites, and then one, putting these devices on that will allow the bats to leave but not get back in. And you'll leave those up for, depends on the temperature, but usually like a week or two to make sure they've all exited. And then once they exit, they can find another place. And then from there, you'll remove those devices and seal up that hole and then they can't get back in. So no wildlife control operators should need to handle bats. They shouldn't need to kill bats. All they need to do is know how to exclude bats. The only problem that um, we run into is it, uh, wildlife control operators and other folks try to exclude bats during the pup season. And that's bad because the pups can't, um, they can't leave, they can't fly yet. So there's no humane way to exclude them. And unfortunately, wildlife control, control operators still do it. And especially when people don't know enough and um, just want people, you know, want the exclusion, the wildlife control operators to just do it. They're just too afraid of bats and really care. Um, but the more, of course, they know, the better. Um, so if they can just as long as the bats are sealed out of the living space, um, like for example, an attic, wildlife control operator can come in and, and make sure you're safe and wait until um, July, the end of July, and they should the pups should be able to fly by then. So basically, May to July, pups can't fly. Um, keep that in mind. So if you have a problem, get it, get it taken care of now. All right. Coming up on that week, it's always the last week of October. It is an international celebration. Check out thatweek.org. It has so much information, so many resources. Um, uh, anything you could you could want to know more about bats, how you can participate in this um, celebration. For us, we have uh, SC Bat Week. A couple of things going on this slide. We have a South Carolina bat working group that you are more than welcome to join. Please do. Uh, we have an annual meeting um, November 17th at Santee State Park. Uh, check out our bat working group webpage, which is just all those words together, shoved together, South Carolina bat working group.org. We'll add you to our listserv and, and let you know more about the meeting as it's coming up. We send out one or two emails a month. So it's really pretty, pretty easy. Go check out that website because we have the governor's proclamation for Bat Week this um, this year's one, and this year's proclamation. We have Bat Week events from for this year, so check that out too because it's really cool. There's even some that started earlier, I think on the twentieth, uh, and then we have an educational flyer that we always like to share with folks. All right. In conclusion, I hope you've learned why bats are so fascinating, why they benefit us how they're harmed by us and how they're harm harmed by white nose syndrome, but that there are things you can do to help them. And um, all is not lost as long as people are trying to help and um, prevent the spread of white nose syndrome, for example. Um, there is some hope for these species, even though I talked about the, a lot of them being decimated and, and um, declining rapidly, there has been hope for tricolored bats. We've been seeing them decline but not go to zero. And then those populations have been slowly increasing in the last few years. So there is hope that they're figuring it out. They just need habitat, conservation measures, and um, you know, people telling educating others about how important they are. With that, I want to thank the Greenville Zoo for that grant to put that bat box up at Santee Coastal. And then we have so many other partners and volunteers that help us run bat projects across the entire state. So really want to thank everyone, for those, um, as well as Bat Conservation International and Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation for some of these bat photos. All right, with that, hopefully we have a few, a little bit of time for questions. Okay, thanks, Jen, for that. Every time I hear you talk, I learn new things about bats. And oh, good. Very exciting. 
Uh, we've got a number of questions. I'll just start going through them. Uh, the first question we had uh, was before you put up all the South Carolina bats was what type of bats do we have here? So, yeah. Um, so uh, what, um, what we have is the next question is if you wanted to photograph bats, how would you go about it in a conservation and educational perspective? Oh, that is a great question. I think the um, the best way to photograph them, yeah, I, I haven't tried myself outside of my just my phone. And um, I would say go to Sunrift Adventures and Traveler's Rest if you can, or anywhere else that has bat boxes and bats emerging. You can catch some emerging from the boxes, and that um, is a great way to practice taking pictures too, especially if it's a big colony, because there's a lot coming out at once. Obviously, it's tricky with the the light <laughs> at nighttime, so um, I think that's the that's the hardest thing. Uh, we get pictures of bats in hibernacula, but of course, I don't usually recommend people go into hibernacula for that. Um, I'm always happy to share photos that I've taken as well. Um, but yeah, the the Traveler's Rest bat boxes at Sunrift have um, they actually they have lights um, on the building, and so you can watch the bats coming. Um, and have a little bit more light that way, that location. Okay, no, great answer. And that's a good question too, especially on being sustainable for, for bat conservation and being responsible and taking the, the pictures when you do. Yeah. Uh, next question is why is white nose syndrome on their nose? Yeah, it's their nose and um, some of their wing membranes that the fungus uh, grows on first, I believe. I think because it's like exposed skin, um, the, yeah, yeah. The, of course the rest of their body is furred. So it's that exposed skin that the fungus begins to grow on. And the fungus does like humidity as well, which unfortunately the bats do too. So the bats hibernate in these specific environments that the fungus loves as well, which is cold and humid. Okay. Um, Bats were blamed early on as one of the animals responsible for COVID being transmitted to humans. How has the pandemic affected bat conservation efforts? Yes, great question. I didn't include one of the other slides I had in here before, but it has COVID, the fear of COVID and that a misinformation in the beginning, especially um, caused lots of, uh, worldwide caused lots of people to kill colonies of bats just out of fear. So unfortunately, it was like one news thing after another about caves of bats being destroyed by people because they were afraid. Um, and again, because of that misinformation. But that all happened. And then a lot of, of conservation organizations and other people that knew was wrong stepped up. And there was a huge response to that. And a lot of better information came out. A lot more people started talking about it. And um, that really stepped up. Um, the help for bats at that point. So luckily people are paying attention and trying to get the word out that bats should not be scapegoats. A lot of times because they're so misunderstood, they're blamed for lots of diseases and uh, people will claim, you know, they have a really good immune system. So there are, that's where a lot of that concern comes from, but a lot of it is misinformation and unfounded. Okay. Yes, and, and as you mentioned, Bat Conservation International is a great resource, and some of those additional questions on conservation internationally with bats, uh, they're they're a great uh, organization to learn more about. Yeah. Next question, is there any social media that we can follow to follow along with the bat conservation work you do or any other organization doing? Yeah, we... I try my best to get word out there on, on different things that we've done. Um, so it's a good reminder. Uh, so South Carolina DNR's social media is a good one to keep an eye on. They have lots of other things they talk about, of course, lots of um, fish and game and others, other species as well. But they have us on there sometimes when I when I get to get them some information. Um, one of the big things that's upcoming that I haven't really shared with too many people yet is that we just discovered the endangered gray bat in South Carolina, which we hadn't had yet. 
Um, it was just on the outskirts. North Carolina had found a bunch. Georgia had some, and their range was just skirting like <laughs> around us. And I was like, that that can't be right. So we finally found them some bridges recently, and we're really excited about adding them to our our bats and trying to learn more about them. Of course, if they're not recorded in the state, it's hard to find funding for them. But now that we finally have those records, maybe we can learn more about that species. And that's in the um, in the upstate in Greenville and Oconee counties. Okay, no, that's great to see. Just adding another bat to the species we have here. Yeah. What is the best thing to do if a bat enters your home to safely remove it? Yes, great question. So if it enters your home, obviously you're isolating at first. You're checking with DHEC to make sure no one was potentially exposed. And if they say you're good, you know, no one woke up with it, all those other things I mentioned. Then... Um, I generally, there's, there are different ways you can go about it. You can open doors and windows and, and try to shoot them out. Um, another thing that people recommend is getting, you know, wearing long sleeves, wearing thick gloves and, um, still not touching it, but you're going to get a, a, a cardboard box and like a lid or a thick piece of paper or folder or something like that. And if you can get that box over the bat and then slide that um, lid or whatever in between the bat and the box, and then just you'll have the bat in the box and you can take it outside and let it go. Um, you just, it, you gotta be careful, obviously, but that's okay. a recommendation. All right, great, great tip there. Uh, next is on average, how many offspring or pups can one female produce during a mating season? Yes, great question. So our smaller bat species, unfortunately, the ones that are most at risk from white nose syndrome, only have one to two pups every year total. Um, the tree bats tend to have more like four pups, sometimes up to six, which is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, so it depends on the species. Okay. Uh, next question is where where can one volunteer? And you mentioned already some toward the tail end of it, but if you could recap some of those opportunities would be great. Yeah, feel free to reach out to me. We have, it depends on what you wanna do. So I think the, the levels are easiest as bat watch. If you can find a place to count bat boxes and I can always point you in the a direction of one if, you, if you'd like. Uh, the next level is uh, counting bats in culverts. Um, so you can join me and my technician and record bats hibernating in culverts. And then the hardest is netting because you're working five hours after sunset, um, checking nets and recording bat data. So also feel free to get a hold of me on that and I'll just add you to our list. And so when we have, when it's time for that, we only net bats in the spring and summer. So it'd be April through August or so that we net bats. Jen, what would be the best way for folks to get in touch with you? Yes, let me put my email in the chat. And um, my phone number two. Sometimes my email gets a little crazy. I can always reach everybody. Okay, and I'm going to sort of go full circle back to that first question. I um, I think if somebody does want to know the species, I went onto your great website for scdnr.gov, um, and it lists all the bats as you go navigate through wildlife and such. So if you do want a listing, uh, that's a great resource there for what, um, what bat information you can get for the state. Yeah, let me throw that in the chat too. Mm, I can find this chat again. There it is. There's our wildlife. Yeah, that's it. Okay, that, that is the questions. Uh, we're done with the questions. We appreciate everybody joining in and we uh, will have this uh, presentation as a recording to view on our website. Uh, it'll take a little while to get it uh, edited and and produced so that it, it's available for viewing. So just keep checking back on the lecture 
page for for that or reach out to the zoo. We'll try to get word out uh, through social media probably is a good way to do it as well. Um, we thank everybody for their interest. We're looking to set up some additional talks in the near future. So stay tuned to Facebook for the zoo and our website. And uh, thanks again for joining in. And Jen, thanks for taking the time to present more bat information for for our folks. Yeah, sure. Thanks again for having me and go bats. All right. Thank you.